This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. So great to see you today. If you would turn your attention to the 28th chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, and beginning with the first verse, I'm reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture. Notice there these words. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. And as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. And the people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, A murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. And Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. And the people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. Near the shore where they landed, where, where we landed, was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. And he welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him and laying his hands on him, he healed him. And then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. And as a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sell, People supplied us with everything that we would need for the trip. I want to talk today from the subject, bitten while building. Bitten while building. Isn't it interesting here that the Apostle Paul, on the ancient island of Miletus, now known as the modern-day island of Malta, he's out there, they're, they're shipwrecked here, and... And, and, and then they, they, they come here to a place uh, of barbaric people. And it, that doesn't mean that they were just uncivilized. It means these were, these were not Jewish people. They, they considered everybody who wasn't like them as barbaric. And uh, as they were welcomed on the island, it's, it's amazing how the opinions of people change. When he was first bitten by the, by this, the snake, this snake, poisonous snake a viper is a poisonous snake when he was bitten by the viper and it was hanging onto the, his hands isn't it amazing how people formed an opinion about him and said he must be a murderer and that though he survived the sea he didn't survive on the land because something bit him on his hand but this is not the first time that we see a snake attaching itself to humanity Remember, the first time we saw the snake attaching himself to somebody was when the serpent attached himself to Eve in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. He attached himself to her using his mouth. Because the serpent at that, abil at that time had a, uh, an ability to communicate somehow. And he talked to Eve. And he used his mouth to attach himself to Paul. And let me just tell you, you have to be able to take the place of your pain and turn it into the place of your power. Because the very snake that bit his hand, it was the same hand that Paul laid to bring healing to others. The very place that you have been injured, maybe, just maybe, God will take the very thing that almost took you out and use the same hand that has been attacked and use it to bring blessing to others. Don't ever count God out. Don't ever count him out. And, and don't, don't, don't let people, when, when, when they, they see you and they don't understand you, because see, they misjudged Paul. 
Things are not always as they seem. They looked like they were one way and they said, no, 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 no. He must be a murderer. And isn't it amazing that when he survived, they switched from a murderer to say he must be a god. Now you're talking about a 180 degree a turn, 180 degree turn here. Their, their opinion changed on a dime. And, and, and he was attacked, but yet he survived. And oftentimes, it seems like we get attacked when we are trying to do something positive, trying to help somebody else. Paul was out here, you know, they had built a fire to, uh, to warm them coming in from, from shipwreck and to welcome them. And Paul is gathering sticks to help build the fire. He's trying to do something good. It really hurts you when you get bitten while you're trying to help folks. And this is what Paul was doing. I mean, you know, I mean, if you get bitten while you're on your way to do some devilment. I mean, we, we consider that to be justified in some way. You know, you, if you've got some evil intent on you and you're going to do some devilment and then you get bitten while you're in the process of doing evil, we can understand that. But when you get bitten while you're trying to help build something to comfort people, when you're trying to serve people and you get bitten, when you're trying to help people and then they assign wrong motives to you. Are you listening to me? I mean, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts when the people that you're trying to help accuse you of something. It's better to be accused from an enemy than somebody that's supposed to love you that you're trying to help. This is what happened to the apostle Paul. But Paul didn't waste his time putting his mouth on people that put their mouth on him. Paul didn't even waste his time with what bit him. By trying to bite out stuff back to them. Paul kept on doing what he was doing. Paul was building this fire. When this poisonous snake bit him on the hand. And just remember this now. The hands represent our works. The hand represents our works. So the enemy was trying to stop Paul's works. The enemy knew that when Paul reached the island of Malta. That Paul was going to use that hand to lay on Publius' uh, you know, a father-in-law and, and, and bring healing to him. And then it was going to break out a healing revival. And he was trying to stop what Paul was on his way to do. So he bit him as a sign that he was trying to stop his work. And so I just came to remind you today that the attack that you are dealing with is not personal. T touch somebody next to you. Tell them that the attack is not personal. It's not personal. It's not personal. The attack that you're dealing with is not personal. It is about the work that you are doing. It's about the work that you're doing. It is about what you are building. I mean, I want you to write these three words down. It's about what you're doing, 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 doing. Write that word down, doing, doing. It's about what you're building, building, building. Write that word down, building. And it's about who you are becoming, becoming, becoming. The attack of the enemy that is on you. Whenever you get really attacked by the devil. He's not trying to attack what you were. He's trying to attack what you're doing. He's trying to attack what you're building. Or he's trying to attack who you are becoming. He's trying to stop you from coming into your destiny and power and position. He's trying to stop you from becoming Moses. So he puts out an issue to kill all of the babies to and under. He's trying to stop Jesus. That's why they're killing the babies. He wasn't trying to kill a baby. He was trying to kill a king. He was trying to kill the one that was going to mature into the king. He's trying to stop what you're doing and stop what you're building and stop who you are becoming. The attack is not about anything in your past. The attack is about what's in your future. That's why the devil doesn't waste his time attacking people who have no future. But if you got a future, my God, my God, he's coming after you with both barrels cocked. I'm just telling you, he's coming after you. He's coming after you. He's coming after you. But it's about what you're doing. It's about what you're building. And it is about who you are becoming. He's after your destiny. Your goal is in your destiny. That's why when you understand the power of a dream, when you start dreaming, dreaming is ability to see into the future. Whenever you get a dream, you got a glimpse of what already awaits you. In another time, in another dispensation, and that's why you work on it right now, because you see it. 
You see now what God has there. He allows you to see it now. And the devil, when he bites you on the hand, is trying to stop your works, what you're doing, what you're building, and who you are becoming. And I want, to, I want you to be reminded of this. Don't confuse yourself with those who try to attach themselves to you with those who are assigned to you. See, some people just want to be attached to you. Blood suckers. They just want to be attached to you. Leeches. They just want to attach themselves to you. Don't confuse those who try to attach themselves to you to those who are assigned to you. Can I give you another word of wisdom? Don't get attached to anybody or anything that is not attached to God. You see, the very serpent in the Garden of Eden that started talking to the woman was not attached to God. You don't want to get attached to anything or anybody that is not attached to God. Because if it is not attached to God, it's going to try to get you to walk away from your destiny. It's going to try to talk you out of something. And we don't even realize how the enemy is biting people who are trying to build something. He doesn't waste his time trying to stop people who are not going anywhere. He'll only try to stop you when you're doing something, when you're building something, or when you're becoming something. And I want you to realize that opposition is a normal thing in the world whenever there is opportunity. Because opportunity comes with opposition. Opportunity comes with opposition. And you know, when, when Peter told Jesus, you know, Peter, he got sort of frustrated because Jesus was making some, some statements. And, and, and Peter, you know, he was impetuous. Other folks, were, they may not have understood what he was saying, but they were scared to say anything. But Peter wasn't scared. And Peter said, listen, Jesus, we have given up everything to follow you. He said, now listen, we, 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 we left everything. I gave up my fishing. All of, he said, listen, we gave up everything to follow you. Now, you don't talk to the king of glory like that and think that he's not going to come back at you. Jesus came back at Peter when Peter said that, Peter said, we've given up everything. Jesus responded to him in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. Notice this. Jesus said, yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that every one of you who has given up house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. Peter's up there talking about, listen to Jesus, and listen, we done given up everything to follow you. Jesus said, you, you go, you've given up something, but you're going to get much more. You're going to get much more. But what I want you to really see here is that Jesus taught the principle here that blessings come with persecution. Blessings come with persecution. Blessings come with persecution. The question to you today is, can you stand to be blessed? Because blessings come with persecution. You get blessed and you will get persecuted. I'm just telling you, blessings come with persecution. Blessings come with persecution. And I don't know why, but for some reason, we expect that whenever we are attempting to do something that is good, that everything will flow in our direction. But the reality is, is that sometimes we experience opposition and controversy. Uh, here's the principle. We are not disappointed by what we find in life, but by what we expect to find. You're not disappointed by what you find in life, but by what you expect to find. And when you expect it, when you expect something, uh, and then you don't find that thing, then you're disappointed. Disappointment is always the distance between expectation and reality. And if your expectancy, when a woman marries a man and she expects him to be Prince Charming. And he expects her to be this wonderful princess. Always so kind and sweet and accommodating. And the expectancy is here. And then they meet the reality. 
Because while they were dating, would you like some popcorn when, I, when I'm getting some? <laughs> and when they get married, if you're going to get some, bring me some back too. <laughs> Disappointment, it is the distance between what you expect and what you realize in the real world. You see, there is the ideal, the ordeal, and the real. Oh my God, we don't have time to go there today. That's a whole nother message. But I, I just want you to understand that it's not what we find in life that disappoints us. It's what we expect to find. But I've got good news for you. I love something that Charlie Chaplin said. He said, nothing is permanent in this wicked world, not even our troubles. Isn't that good to know? I don't know about you, but that blessed me. <laughs> nothing is permanent in this wicked world, not even our troubles. Whatever you're dealing with right now, it is not permanent. Whatever trouble that you have, it is not permanent. It is not permanent permanent no problem lasts forever not even your troubles are permanent thank God for that but you will be bitten while you're building and you assume that if you're doing something to help somebody that everything is supposed to flow your way I remember my mother was going one time to take some groceries to an old lady who was confined to her home and she went to the grocery store and my mother had about six bags of groceries that she had shopped for this lady and was taking the stuff to her, to her home. And, 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 and there she was on I-20, you know, just singing and flying on her way to serve this lady. And in the rear view, she noticed these blue lights. And she was not in Kmart. And they pulled her over and gave her a ticket and mama just broke down because she didn't understand. She's like, Lord, I'm out here trying to do something to help somebody. And you let me get a ticket. Have you ever, have you ever <laughs> had something bad to happen to you while you were doing something good? You know, now like I said, if you into some devil men and you get a ticket on your way to buy weed, You understand that it's justified. There are no questions. You know, you know it's like, whoo, whoo, whoo. Thank God that they pulled me over before I got there. But when you're on your way to do something good for somebody, when you're on your way to bless somebody, and you get pulled over, you see, my mother was just caught up in the spirit, just singing the praises of God, feeling good because she's serving somebody that was in need. And then blue lights are pulling her over, bitten while building. And I don't know what it is. What's the blue light in your life that becomes a distraction that pulls you over while you're building something, while you're serving, while you're trying to do good, and you get bitten, somebody puts their mouth on you. Why you were building trying to do something good for somebody. It hurts when you get punished for doing wrong. But it's terribly, doubly agonizing when you get bitten while you're trying to serve and help somebody. Nehemiah was bitten while he was rebuilding the broken down walls of Jerusalem. But he didn't stop. And he wouldn't come down from the work. He realized there are going to be some folks that's going to try to bite me while I'm building. So he built with a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. And that just lets you know it's just a reminder to us that you may be bitten while you're trying to build something. So you better have a tool and a weapon. And John the Baptist was bitten while he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And it's saying that repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was telling them repent, repent, repent. And guess what? Because he spoke the truth, he spoke truth to power. He offended Herod uh, because Herod's uh, brother's wife, Herodias, uh, was, a, was a loose woman. And, and, uh, and, and Philip, the, the, the brother of, of, of Herod, had, had done some unscrupulous things. And, and, and 
John the Baptist spoke truth to power and they didn't like him and, and they sought reason to just mess with him and he's out now preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and, and now he gets arrested. They throw him in jail, bitten while building, but he kept on preaching. Jesus was bitten while he was teaching the multitude in his own hometown of Nazareth. And, uh, and they bit him in, in his own hometown because they didn't, they didn't respect who he was. They couldn't see who he was. They were too familiar with his mama and his daddy. Is this not the carpenter's son, Joseph's son? Isn't this, isn't this Mary's boy? Didn't even understand who he was and he was bitten while building. They, they tried to apprehend him and the Bible says Jesus, he slipped away, he conveyed himself away because he said my time hadn't come yet. You can't catch, you can't touch this. And he just slipped away, just slipped away, but he was bitten while he was building. And let me just remind you that same slithering serpent is still trying to bite people who are doing stuff, building stuff, and becoming more. He's still trying to bite them. And I want you to recognize how he bites you. He bites you by putting his mouth on you. By whispering to you, it'll never work. By trying to trick people to say, just a little bit won't hurt. Just by whispering to you, you're not good enough. Just by whispering to you, you don't have the right credentials. Just by whispering to you, you're the wrong gender. You're the wrong race. You're too old. You're too young. You don't have the right look. You're not from the right background. Suppose they laugh at you. Suppose you are rejected. Suppose you are denied. These are little bites to try to stop you while you're building. And you know, everybody who's a parent, parents are often bitten by their own children. Bitten by their attitudes and bitten by their words. Because they oftentimes will go through periods of ingratitude, entitlement, and disrespect. Isn't it amazing? You sacrifice for them. And, and, uh, and when it's their birthday, they're looking for a gift and they don't realize and you pay the gas bill. <laughs> and the cell phone bill. And get their school clothes. And deal with them every time that they're sick, you know. I mean, do, I mean, suppose parents sent their children a bill <laughs> when they turn 18 or 21 and you, and you, want, you want a full reimbursement <laughs> for all of your gas of taking them, driving them to school and picking them up from practice and every time you ate out somewhere, you want a full reimbursement. And, and, and yet we are bitten with ingratitude and bitten with entitlement and bitten with disrespect, but keep on building anyhow. Listen, we don't do what is right because we get thanked for it. We do what is right because it is right. At the end of the day, you do what is right because it is right. Not because gratitude is expressed to you. You do what is right because it is right. Even if I weren't thanked for the ministry that I do, I'm still going to do it because I'm called to do it. Paul was bitten while trying to do something good, but do good anyhow. Because what comes out of the mouth of those that you're trying to help, it really hurts you more than the attack of your enemy's mouth. I, I love something called the Paradoxical Commandments that was written by Dr. Kent Keith. Uh, he wrote that in, in 1968 uh, as a booklet for student leaders. And I, I just want you to hear these, these Ten Commandments that, that he wrote back in 1968. Uh, he says, people are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. The second commandment. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. Then he said, if you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. 
Then he says that the good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. And he says honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. Then he says the biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. And he says people favor underdogs but follow only top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyway. And he says that what you spend years building might be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. And people really need help but may attack you if you do help them. Help people anyway. And he says give the world the best you have and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. Let me say it to you this way. Don't let what bites you stop you. Don't let what bites you stop you. You got to be bitten and learn how to shake it off and keep building. Be bitten, but don't let it stop you. I want you to remember, because you know, what happens if you're doing good and you get bitten by something? It's like the first impulse that comes to your mind is like, you know what, man, I need to sign up for this. Forget this. <laughs> Forget this. But I want you to remember, whenever you feel that way, remember Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 in the New Living Translation. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. Let us not get tired. Do you see the word not in there? Let us not get tired of doing what is good. Let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those to the family in the family of faith. And I want you to realize that if you're not willing to risk the usual, you'll have to settle for the ordinary. If you're not willing to risk the usual, you'll have to settle for the ordinary. Paul was initially regarded as a bad person because he was bitten. And they said that even though he escaped dying in the sea now karma has come to get him because he's been bitten and he's going to die in a few minutes and they assume that because something bad happened to him that he must be a bad person and you know people can have that kind of theology in their own mind about you that whenever something bad happens to you they say uh -uh, they must have had sin in the camp you know God it caught up with them Something bad happens to somebody and they immediately assume that it's because you did something bad. What about them? You know, but the same judgment that you measure out to somebody else is going to be measured back to you. But here's the fact of the matter is that bad things happen to good people too. Bad things happen to good people too. Sometimes... Good things happen to bad people. Look at me very carefully. Sometimes you're blessed because of you and other times you're blessed in spite of you. God will sometimes bless you in spite of you. In spite of your foolishness. In spite of your lackadaisical attitude, in spite of your slothfulness, in spite of your neglect, God will bless you. Are there any witnesses in the house that you know that God blessed you in some time when you didn't deserve it at all? It was by his mercy. I mean, mercy. I mean, God had mercy on you. He gave grace to you. God will oftentimes bless you in spite of you. It's not always because you did all of the right things and, and dotted every I and crossed every T. God will bless you in spite of you. Notice Psalm 34, 19. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to, rest, to the rescue each time. 
Now notice that. The righteous person faces many troubles. The righteous, it didn't say the sinner. It says the righteous person faces many troubles. But the Lord comes to the rescue each time. You don't have to be evil to deal with trouble. Psalm 34, 19 says the righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. And see, if somebody see, catches you facing trouble, they are assume that you're paying for sin. You're not paying for sin. Jesus paid for it. There's no need in you're paying a bill that he's already paid. Jesus paid the bill. He paid it all. He paid it all. The righteous person, though, faces many troubles, but the Lord comes, he, he, he comes to the rescue each time. Notice the word of the Lord in the New Testament. Somebody said, well, that's Old Testament. Here's the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It didn't say evil people. It says everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will. It didn't say maybe. It says will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. You know, one thing, one reason that I think that he allows us to be bitten sometimes while doing good is because you can get comfortable doing good. And pain awakens us immediately to God. When you get in pain, it's like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> the minute pain hits you, you start calling on God. I mean, the minute that pain hits you, he lets you get bitten sometimes so you'll call on the Lord, you'll draw near to him, that you will turn to him and depend upon him. God has a reason even that he allows pain to come our way. But isn't it something that even though he was bitten and hurt by the snake, Physically, the Bible says that there was no harm that came to him. So I encourage you, don't let what fastens to your hand infect your heart. Don't let what fastens itself to your hand infect your heart. Because remember, your hands represent your works. Don't let your works interfere with your worship. Don't let what happens with your hand infect your, your heart. Learn to... Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Don't let it infect your heart. Shake it off. Life is too short for you to live with bitterness in your heart toward other human beings. It's not even worth it. Let me just tell you something. I don't know why we think that every time something happens, we have to start blabbing it and running our mouth about everything. Listen, let me tell you something. When you grow up, you quit running your mouth so much. You really do. Have you ever noticed really seasoned people? I mean seasoned. I, I'm not talking to people that have gray highlights. <laughs> I'm talking about really seasoned people. Have you ever noticed two old people out eating? They don't just be running their mouth off to each other. They'll sit there and they, I've, I've watched and I'm like, do they even like each other? It's like they won't even say anything the whole time. But I realize that when you get a certain age... You just don't run your mouth a whole lot. Because you start returning to the simplicity of a child. And when we start off, children don't run their mouth a lot. They don't say but a few words. Mama, eat, eat, mama. Their vocabulary is very limited. They don't say a whole lot. They're not having a whole lot of conversation. And when you get on the, on the flip side of that, when you're on the coming into the winter years of your life, you don't do a whole lot of running of your mouth. Life is too short for us to be running our mouths, talking about things that won't matter 10 years down the road, five years down the road. And if it's not enough to stress you five years from now, don't stress over it now. Just ask yourself, will this thing matter to me five years down the road? And if it will not matter five years down the road, don't let it matter so much and start robbing your life now talking about what your ex did. Listen, let it go. Shake it off. Don't let it go to your heart. What bit you on the hand, don't let it go to your heart. What bit you on the hand, don't let it go to your heart. Shake it off. you got to keep your heart right. We've got to keep our hearts right in the midst of everything that bites you. In life, and there are some things that will bite you. 
But it leads us to trust God so that he gets the glory out of our life. Because humility is God's anti-inflammatory. It keeps us from swelling. Humility. It's God's natural anti-inflammatory. And there is a difference between swelling and growth. Don't let people swell you. Let God grow you. You know how you can tell the difference between swelling and growth? Sometimes they look the same. You can be hurt and swollen and people say, man, you've grown. But swelling is always temporary. Give it time and it goes down. Put some ice on it, it goes down. Drain the infection, it goes down. But when you've grown, put some ice on it, you still swole. There's a difference between growth and swelling. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 and 10. This is Apostle Paul. He says, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. We're talking about humility now, God's anti-inflammatory. He says, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without resort, results. For I have worked harder than any other apostle, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. This is the apostle Paul now in his humility. He's grown a little bit now by the time he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says, I am the least of all the apostles. No wonder he could shake it off and not be offended by it and let it go to his heart. The Lord protects those whose hearts trust safely in him. You ever notice the Bible in Psalm 91 verse 14? Notice this. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When you trust in the name of the Lord, God will protect you. When your trust is in God, not in your 401k. When your trust is in God, not in the best doctor. When your trust is in God, is in the Lord our God, he will protect you. You see, offenses will come. You're going to have offenses where you'll be bitten by many things and many people in life. They will come, but the Bible says, woe through whom they come. Notice Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17 in the contemporary English version. It says, the world is in for trouble because of the way that it causes people to sin. There will always be something to cause people to sin, but anyone who does this will be in for trouble. The ones that bring offenses. But I want you to realize this. We can depend upon God's word. And because God's word is immutable, our faith is unshakable. Because God's word is immutable, our faith is unshakable. And I want to encourage you today to refuse to become weary in well-doing. Because discouragement is the most commonly used tool of the devil. Discouragement. If he can bite your hand with discouragement and discourage you to stop your doing the works. To stop you from building and to stop you from becoming. That's his plan. Is to stop you from doing stop you from building, and stop you from becoming. But be not weary in well-doing. He reminds us in Galatians 6. Don't be weary in well-doing because you will reap in due season at the right time if you don't faint. You will reap a harvest that is well worth it. Be not weary in well-doing. You have to remind yourself of that when you're raising children. You have to remind yourself of that when you're working on somebody else's job, helping their dream to come true. You have to remind yourself of that when you're laboring, serving somebody else's vision. You have to remind yourself, be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap in due season if you faint not. So you keep building. You keep on praying. You keep on trusting. You keep on believing. You keep on serving. You keep on praying in the Spirit. You keep on singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. You keep on encouraging one another. You keep on building up. You keep on edifying. You keep on bringing deliverance to others. You keep laying your hands on others. You keep prophesying. 
You keep letting the blessings of God flow out of you. Every place that you go, you have to resolve in your own heart that I'm going to be a conduit of God's blessing. That God's favor will work in me and then through me. You keep on laboring in love. You keep on serving without looking for a reward. Keep on giving without saying, where is mine? Where is mine? Keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. Be not weary in well doing because you will reap in due season if you faint not. You may be bitten while you're building and you probably will be, but keep on building anyhow. Keep on raising anyhow. Keep on encouraging anyhow. Don't let negativity stop you. Don't let what bites you stop you. Keep on building. Keep on working. Keep on laboring. Keep on trusting. Keep on standing. Keep on running. Keep on doing this thing for Jesus. He's got something that he doesn't want you to become weary in well doing. Saying that I'm getting tired down here. It's taking too long. You keep on laboring. There is a harvest. In the appropriate time. In due season. I'm just here to remind you that if somebody's due season. It's just around the corner. If you just. If you don't become impatient. And try to usurp the authority of God. Your due season is right around the corner. I'm just telling you. When you plant. There is a due season for the harvest to come. Whatever, whatever, whatever is planted. When it rains, it's coming back up. It's coming back up. It is coming back up. Don't be weary in well-doing. Don't worry about doing good and nobody takes the time to thank you for your labor, for your sacrifice, for your putting up with trifling people, for your dealing with, with misunderstood motives. Keep on serving. Keep on giving. Keep on helping. Keep on building. Keep on uplifting. Keep on encouraging. Don't be weary in well-doing. You will be bit, but don't let it stop you in Jesus' name. You've got to be determined. I'm going all the way. I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to let sickness stop me. I'm not going to let unappreciative people stop me. I'm not going to let disrespectful people stop me. I am going to finish my assignment in the name of Jesus. That what God started in me, he's going to finish it. He's the author and the finisher, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Whatever God has started, he will finish it. And if you trust him, if you trust him, if you trust him, God will protect you. He will protect your interests. He'll protect your destiny. He'll protect your marriage. He'll protect your son and your daughter. He will. Blessed is a man that trusts in the Lord. There's a blessing that comes from trusting in the Almighty God. There is a blessing that comes from trusting in Him. There is a blessing that comes from trusting in Him. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.